There we go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, welcome <laughs> in the chat, in the chat se um, section, if you could just let us know where you're joining us from. And if you are watching on Facebook as well, if you could just let us know where you're joining us. If you have any questions, Dimitri is going to keep an eye on those on uh, Facebook as well. And so let us know and we will, um, we will get to them. Thank you. And before we get started, I, I would like to say welcome to Museum of the African Diaspora in the virtual space. My name is today uh, Gabrielis and I am the Education Program Manager here at MOAD. And I am absolutely thrilled to facilitate today's discussion and virtual tour of Where Is Here. Um, in the opening music we just enjoyed is by Brown Fellini's um, a free jazz in, um, trio formed in San Francisco in 1991, and they were also contributing artists in the exhibition. Before I get too ahead, I would like us to stand in, um, in silence in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Thank you. As many of us are settler, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in, the, in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands, and thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stored this land throughout the generations. All right, so um, joining Dimitri and our beloved docents, Charlie, Remy, Aswan, and Naomi, our uh, curators of Where Is Here, Kathy Zerur and Jacqueline Francis. Um, I just wanna start by saying that this is seriously, seriously, con uh, this is a seriously, seriously condensed introduction, given the credentials and contributions of our special guests today. So my apologies. Uh, with that, this is, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Jacqueline Francis. Hi, Jackie. Um, and a little bit about uh, Jackie is Dr. Jacqueline Francis teaches US history and researches critical questions about minority identities and identification represented in historical and contemporary visual culture. She is the author of Making Race, Modernism and Racial Art in America, um, published in 2012, and co-editor of Ramir Bearden, American, American Modernist, Yale University Press 2011. She is an associate professor um, in the graduate program in visual and critical studies and department of painting and drawing at the California College of the Arts. 
also, we have Kathy Zarur. Um, Kathy Zarur is, uh, Dr. Kathy Zarur is a curator and art historian with a focus on the art, visual culture, and the growing museum industry in the Middle East. She was assistant curator at the 2011 Saraj Biennale, United Arab Emirates. In her research, Zaru considers the historic stat status and recent reception to work by artists from the Middle East in the mainstream Western art, wor uh, art world contests. She teaches contemporary art at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Welcome both and thank you for joining us today to discuss where is here. We just realized that it actually has been um, it has been four years. I thought for some reason three years. So it has been a while. So it's a it's a beautiful re um, reunion today. So I am glad to facilitate this conversation. I would like to start by asking, how did the idea of the exhibition start? Um, you know, these things always start with artists and with talking about artists with friends and talking about artworks with friends. And so um, Kathy and I, you know, started talking about it, um, her introducing me to artists, me introducing her to artists, and, you know, really starting to think about what was it that was drawing us to this work. Um, and I think Kathy should chime in here because she was the one who said it seems like landscape or, you know, any kind of imagery or cultural production around land seems to be something that both of us seem to be drawn to. Yeah, I think, you know, also the, um, the museum itself, the, mu the museum of the African diaspora, the, the notion of place is at the center of the experience of diaspora. So we thought um, that it'd be appropriate, not only because of that, but also because, you know, at, at that time, and we're still experiencing it in San Francisco, the question of, uh, or the experience of gentrification was ongoing. Um, and so it, we wanted to think about people's um, relationships to place uh, because it just felt very um, apropos. Thank you so much. And this back a little bit of everyone's memory. If you've seen the exhibition, we have a, a clip of uh, what it was like in the actual space. And we'll go, we'll go forward to uh, looking at selected works um, with the docents and, um, and the curators. Presented without a body. I want the symbol to both fade and come back like a pulse. So it's a slipstream where you, you, you recognize and you unrecognize. Right. Dissolving of location. Kathy, I'm, I'm thinking as, as we're speaking also that the virtual space being a space in its own and just go, looking back at the actual museum and the actual exhibition. Um, so that was, it was almost kind of jarring to see from us going from the virtual space into the actual space. Um, but with that also, I would like to say Thank you to the artists, uh, um, a special thank you to the artists that who have allowed us to share their work and um, today and therefore their continual support of our education department's mission in MOAD. Um, and you see the artists, we don't have the artwork of all of the artists, but the selected work would be uh, shared with you. And I think it would be really great to start with um, Asya Abdurrahman's Abdur Abdur work. Docents, yeah. what do you say? <laughs> I know. I, I almost feel like, you know, we'll, we could easily go into paragraphs about each of the works, but um, I definitely want, you know, um, the docents here with us, uh, Dimitri and Sade, to also ask questions and, you know, we can jump around with the slides as well, too. So feel free to drive the presentation. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I I love that that casual. Let's let's just talk about it and enjoy the art for what it is. Um, 
and I, I, I feel like I want to start start off on this one as <laughs> one of the people who actually, you know, was was on the team at the time. And um, I wasn't familiar with Asia's work before this exhibition, even though she's a local San Francisco artist. Um, and I immediately was drawn to her work and and following everything that, that she does. And I think this is a really this was a really sweet take um, and and. I will definitely defer to Jackie and Kathy to tell the story about this piece. Um, but I just, I just love the intimacy of these shoes that had had a journey. They, they had lived with someone at some point um, and they had walked miles and miles and, you know, she revived um, the life of the, the, the shoes by, you know, injecting them with the, or covering them with the moss and all these living um, components and the flowers and the crystals and, you know, just, just taking something that normally would be discarded in trash and giving it another life. And that, that was really a sweet um, little testament to someone's life and their journey and the things that we carry with us. So, so for me, it was, it's an appropriate start to the exhibition because it really demonstrates diaspora. You know, I, I, I think the, these, this project reflects two um, interests that Asya has. One is, um, you know, to honor the, the stories of her family members, um, the strength uh, and the courage that it took to overcome uh, significant um, challenges and violence. Um, but also her deep concern with the environment and, and environmental degradation. Um, and so I remember when we, uh, when we talked to her, she said, you're, you're going to have to spritz these shoes to keep the moths alive. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know if we can bring water into the gallery space. But, you know, she wants, she, they're, they're living, they're living. Um, and so, yeah, and she continues to do work on, uh, around environmental concerns. Yeah, so, you know, the project is called In Her Footsteps, even though she doesn't use shoes that were only designed for women's um, feet. Um, there are, in her project, and this is an ongoing series, there are shoes worn by men, including her physician husband. So um, there's an idea that, you know, the her in this is Mother Earth, um, but the footsteps or the wearers um, can be male, female, and other people, you know, using different kinds of gender identities. And I think exactly like Kathy and um, Dimitri have said is to really speak to, you know, Asia's interest, not only in terms of the environment, but also in terms of um, the idea of found material that is then transformed by the artist. Um, you know, using moss, using fungus, using shells, um, using quartz, um, mm. very much interested in um, copper wire, um, things like um, different kinds of um, flora, baby's breath, etc. And, you know, there's obviously, you know, she's using color, you know, by using all these materials and texture. Mm. So even though it's something that relates to something in the world, um, and she's not painting it, you know, she is creating an image, creating an image and an object, obviously. And we have a question uh, Kitsan is asking, is some of her work planned to break down? Like, is it supposed to degrade or kind of return to the earth? Um, I think some of her works, generally speaking, she, not generally, but she, she will often use materials that are um, fragile. Uh, so I think that she's, very into that idea. Um, in this case, as I said, she wanted to keep keep the moss alive. And when we did the studio visit, um, she had the you know had them out uh, in the open and continuously was spritzing them, um, harvesting the moss and the materials sometimes from her from her backyard. Um, it's an interesting to to think about this question of um, the planned breakdown because. Um, She's also, you know, by evoking the, the, or by using copper, she is evoking mining practices. So she's thinking about the, um, the ways in which, you know, our needs as consumers um, are impacting the earth. 
I wanted to ask, is she, is there anything in here where she's talking about the relationship of, in terms of us as Africans wearing shoes in the first place? Mm. Africans wearing shoes in the first place? Yeah, in terms of being, you know, we're being barefoot, mm. um, a lot of a lot of us like to be barefoot and just this whole idea of wearing mm. wearing shoes in terms and then and then putting the moss on top of the shoes to mm. give them a further life, to give them a further art form. It's almost like to me, it just feels like there's this whole idea of being barefoot and having your feet in the grass mm. and then having to put shoes on, but then putting the moss <laughs> back onto the shoes <laughs> to have your feet in the grass. Beautiful. Yeah, that's very, you know, I think that's a very rich reading because again, you, you might see the shoe underneath, but the whole, um, the whole strategy she takes with the materials then makes it totally not useful as a shoe, right? It's, it's counterproductive in a way, you know? So in a way it's like, these are not to be made um, um, utilitarian in any way ever again. <laughs> you know, speaking of utilitarian, I, I kind of want to um, go to the next artist with the benches. Yeah, so you heard a little bit of Christopher Kosher's voice in the brief clip, the 30 second clip we saw. Yeah. And, you know, Chris talks about um, um, these ideas of benches as being ubiquitous. That is mm -hmm. to say, every culture has benches or something to sit on um, in um, everyday life, whether it's um, benches at a, um, a, a road crossing, um, benches in a school, um, benches in an office, benches in a home, that there's something that seems to be um, very much universal about these simple utilitarian objects. And what he's done is he's overlaid um, these ancient map drawings onto the imprint of the bench outline and then made this a stamp on these little pieces of cardstock that are held up with the binder clips. Um, he jokes about um, growing up in the Caribbean. Um, he's based in Trinidad, um, but his parents were civil servants. They were office workers. And he said, you know, some of his earliest toys were office supplies. So he sees himself in a way that his art has come through um, this family access um, to things that they were doing in their professional lives. And, you know, for these particular um, um, cards, you know, they become, much almost like a, a formation. Um, you know, you can evoke uh, Beyonce's formation or just the general term formation, um, militaristic, uniform, organized, maybe even a marching band. And, you know, Kathy can speak to the fragility of this mm -hmm. um, installation because on opening night, there's some great photos of her upstairs um, because I think it, they either got brushed or maybe just the wind current of people going by, they became like a children's game. It just kind of all fell over and everybody kind of squatted down and <laughs> helped out picking them up. Yeah, you know, it's also thinking about this, um, the colonial map. I mean, there, all of the works in this, in this exhibition are, are so open-ended that you can really, um, you can, you can take many different readings from them. Um, and when I was uh, thinking about this project again today, I, I thought about um, the, the colonial, the networks that emerge through colonialism, um, where it, one site might be a site of production, where another site might be one of consumption. So um, a, a, a product is produced in, in one colonial place to be sold to an, uh, people in another uh, colonial colony. Um, and um, and then again, you know, the, the bureaucracy uh, in which his parents uh, worked um, and, and that he grew up with these office supplies, you know, this way of, of organizing and managing um, um, systems and creating these systems of, of control. Mm -hmm. I just, I thought about, you know, this is such an interesting way to talk about how colonialism um, really just infuses so, 
even the tiniest details of, of our lives. Um, and, and then the way that it's um, arranged on the, this, this specific installation arranged to kind of take this, take up this large space, um, you know, is sort of a metaphor of, of that sort of far reaching nature of colonialism. And what about the, uh, the Pira? Um, or, um, the Hindi derived word and that Trinidans of Indian descent used to describe a small bench and uh, he, it was this, the, the gesture, the small gesture that, that um, the artist has done, Christopher has done, was to give visitors um, cardboards um, to fold and make their own bench. Could you tell us a little bit about what that extension created and what, in, in terms of the, in the, in the whole concept of the, the show? Yeah, I think it's one of those um, opportunities that a lot of contemporary artists think about the mm -hmm. giveaway, which kind of, um, again, sort of reverses the idea of not only the unique and high value art object in museums, but that the audience can take something away that they themselves are part of creating, not only creating meaning, but actually physically making the work. And I think that that was the little gesture um, mm -hmm. with which the title comes from, that gesture of transference, giving, as opposed to buying, as opposed to selling, but intent, instead collaborating in a way with the artist in terms of a production of an installation, as well as a, an artwork. I know Remy had been telling me about her blue bench um, her blue bench, and we all have stories of these benches, you know, the, the shoe shiners from where I come from, from Addis Ababa. Um, so, you know, each one of us have our, our stories with benches. Um, and yeah, it, this is such this is such a beautiful work. And, you know, I just want to, because we have the recording of, of this um, video also, I want to, it's always nice to hear the artist's voice as well. Um, so let's see. This piece has been created in many different locations and what excites me about it, it doesn't really have a fixed location. You know, it's something I imagine and uh, all the bits of cardboard, who knows where they're made, but they were acquired in different parts of the world, in Johannesburg, in Kentucky, in um, Dartmouth, Dartmouth, in New Hampshire, a little bit, maybe one or two in Port of Spain, and then recently in Baltimore. Um, because everywhere the piece goes, um, you know, I have to change the scale based on the context and then the, the cardboard is acquired. But even if the cardboard is acquired in Baltimore or Johannesburg, you still don't know if it's made in India or somewhere else. You know, so there's that weird dissolving of location. And because I myself, even though people say I'm from Trinidad, this piece might have been thought of in Trinidad, but it actually has been produced in multiple locations, wherever you know, it's been shown wherever I have to think about it. And um, this is going to be this this video. We're going to share a video by Alan de Souza, and it's going to be quiet. So uh, please don't feel like your your speakers are not working. Um, and so <clears throat> I would like to show the video first, then go into the discussion. So I'm, you know, I, we, I could sit here and watch this for a really, really long time, but for the sake of time, I want to bring it back. 
one of the things I really love about this piece is that, you know, this is, we're seeing something that we're used to seeing looking down and it's now changed 90 degrees. So it really changes our perspective on it. So much so that the first time I saw this, I thought, what am I looking at? I, I didn't really quite pick up on what it was at first. So I love the fact that, that we're having this, you know, flip of, of what we would normally see. And then I also love the fact that it's, uh, they're not coordinated. And so each time you're getting a little bit of a di different stereoscopic experience. And so I love it. I think it's so hypnotic. And, you know, you today you were saying, and you could look at this forever. I could too. It's just one of those things that you just can't take your eyes off. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Dimitri. No, I was just going to say, I think again, um, I, th this piece for me, um, and, and I always, it, it, it occupied two enormous walls in the gallery. And so obviously from this, you can't tell the scale, but I want to say that each wall was at least 12 feet wide by 12 feet, um, the big movable walls that we have. So when you were standing in front of it, you were fully immersed and there wasn't a line between the videos. They, 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 they were seamless. Um, and so just standing in front of it, um, and again, it's 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 like Charlie said, it's it's this thing that we are all so familiar with, um, and we're used to looking at in one place. But just that that presentation makes it disorienting. Um, you don't know where it is, you don't know when it is, um, and you know, I, I remember at at certain points, or even right here, right now, you you can tell that the water is receding from a shoreline. Um, but there's certain points where you feel like you're in the middle of an ocean. And so it's like, am I on a boat? Am I on a shore? And where in the world is this? Um, and yeah. <laughs> and then I want to ask that question again. It's just why no sound? Because I think watching this over and over for me was I, 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 I get what Dimitri is saying. Um, is if would, would the sound really tell me where it is? Would that sound had, had given away um, where, where it is. So why is it taken out? And I think it's, it's part of my curiosity to, um, to get more information from this piece. Jackie, do you have, um, do you have something yeah, to add? Yeah, I, I think this is very much Alan's strategy to make it an abstraction. So sound could give you information in terms of maybe uh, horns or bird life or ships passing or even people, you know, hearing bits of language. And so by taking that aspect out of it, he focuses your attention, not only on the visual, but also what you're filling in, you know, because you're gonna fill in sound in a way. We all, you know, have the benefit of watching water come and leave the shore. And so he knows that in your mind, it's almost like you're creating a rhythm and you're creating a soundtrack for it that he has deliberately challenged you to do, which makes you then think about, you know, what are my, what are my, what are my banked memories? It's almost like you're mm -hmm. stuck in that kind of experience. What kind of things do I walk around with in my mind? And even almost in terms of my other senses, in terms of the smell of the sea, the feel of water, you know, the sounds of being at the shore um, that I would automatically fill in. I think also we take sound for granted as well, especially living in a city that is sound polluted. Mm. Um, and those of us who are hearing people, I, I think it's very easy to take sound for granted. For granted. I think a lot about, um, you know, this, the, the coming and the going, right? It, it, we, that's what the, the water is doing. And the shore is the, is that, is the meeting point where, where that, where that's happening. Um, so I, you know, this in a way relates to Asya's project about, you know, movement and migration, even though mm -hmm. that's not something that we talked about specifically to her work or, or we mentioned it, but the, there's, um, you know, this reference to, to migration um, or, or to, to the meeting place, to the, to the place where um, we, we come and the place that we leave. 
um, in this work, but it, through abstraction again. So uh, it leaves it really open um, for people to, as, as Jackie said, to fill in the blanks. And then also, um, would you mind talking about the title? Um, because my understanding is it comes from a Samuel Delaney piece about mm -hmm. um, the about what is true, basically. Yeah, yeah. So the motion of light um, in water is a Samuel Delaney um, novel in which there's an unreliable narrator. So someone who's not really invested in telling you everything in a truthful, literal way, but who is there, obviously, to entertain um, the reader with any kinds of sort of narrative and even counter narrative um, riffs and presentations. And so that is what's inspiring um, Alan here is to think about, you know, what is it that we are invested in when we think of stories? What is our investment in truth? I mean, this can't be any more, um, how shall I say, um, potent in our moments um, since 2016. You know, everybody's talking about not only, um, you know, can't not say it, I guess, the, you know, uh, the truthiness of things and fake news, et cetera. And even, of course, you know, a lot of uh, academics have talked about um, hyper truths, that is to say, mm -hmm. things that seem so obvious, and yet there's so many different narratives around it. Um, there's a student at, Sam, at uh, CCA right now writing about memes and how memes come out of what people pull together as images, and that they then have different narratives, different stories that they construct around it. Well, um, if we move a little bit deeper into the ocean uh, with the next piece, <laughs> or, or the sea, or I don't know where we are, maybe. Uh, but yeah, um, is uh, Terry Fontaine's work. And the first piece I would like us to look at is this one. The perfect day. So, Kathy. Uh, <laughs> Terry is uh, trained as a sculptor. Uh, we, sh we showed photographs in, um, in Where Is Here. Um, so it's, I, I start by saying that he's, he's trained as a sculptor because he's turned the, the objects, which um, is you know, the bounty, um, you know, maybe lunch, he's turned them into sculptures um, you know, by somehow gold leafing it digitally. Uh, but so um, in doing so, he's calling our attention to the objects in, in a different way. Um, all of a sudden they become strange. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're no longer edible um, and, and they're, yeah, they're 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 sculptural, um, and and you know, for me particularly um, in in relationship to the strawberry um, photograph, if, if you wouldn't mind um, moving. Yep, in particular with the strawberry photograph. In this way, I think a lot of this one. I think a lot about oil spills, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, the the other work of art is more like gilding, right? So. Um, so whereas the fish become you know these uh, even more valuable than than they are as food and sustenance perhaps um mm -hmm. the strawberry uh photograph reminds us of things like oil spills and environmental degradation mm -hmm. there we are the, the the most talked about topic in our docents meeting i'll tell you are the eyes yeah. Uh, <laughs> the eyes. And um, I'm, I'm curious if one of the docents would, would like to uh, touch on that. Also, Naomi, I think you have a few questions about this, uh, uh, these pieces. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I, it's kind of, I, I find it kind of interesting that, that he's, he's playing sort of with alchemy and reverse alchemy. You know, like on the one hand, he takes these these you know, very mundane fish, mm -hmm. turns them into gold, you know, and then he flips that around on him, you know, and blackens them, um, and then he does the same thing with the, with the strawberries. And it's it's an odd juxtaposition, 
it's very jarring. It's, it's very, you know, this is very surrealistic. You can imagine a lot of the surrealists from the, you know, 30s and 40s doing work like this. I think it's, it's real interesting from that perspective. I think also for me as a, as a food source, um, you, uh, coming from England, I have to say fish and chips because, <laughs> of the, because of the newspaper, but also just looking at the, the wetness is like, is it oil? Did, were they just fried or is it water because they were just caught? Mm. And so, um, you know, a, again, that whole kind of oil and water with where, you know, water is life and sustenance and then oil can be such a destructive um can be can be unless it's olive oil but you can it can be a, such a destructive piece and i think also we were talking about with the goldfish one um the fact that the newspaper or or remy you kind of were really uh thinking about the newspapers and how not only that but it seems to be some kind of like the economics section or um stock oh, yeah. market we were talking um, about, yeah, yeah of, of the newspaper and then the the blackfish are on this tarp um you know you I, I remember you you like really just pondering about the materials and his choice for um which what each one is um on and, and the tarp and the sea but also the tarp is you know the, this the, the way that they're juck they're they're uh formed together is almost like these islands and then it made us start thinking of the islands of plastic and the fact that he has it on plastic. <laughs> we were kind of yeah. going off on it. <laughs> yeah. And I think we also, the, with the big question was how did he recreate these eyes to be so piercing and so mm. clear at the same time? It's like the, the fish eye. Yeah, and for me, confrontational. It's like, are you really, you know, it's a, they just ask questions to me. <laughs> are you looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm a little disappointed that he did the coloring digitally. I had this image of him sitting there painting each one of these fish <laughs> with this fish oil all over his hands. And, you know, I can move yeah. a little bit less now. These really decorative, you know, um, in the best sense of the world, you know, mm -hmm. to create this thing that's, again, not something that you're going to grab. It's not like food um food porn or mm. food design like you don't want to pop this in your mouth and yet it is a beautiful attraction to the sort of juxtaposition of colors and the suggestion of shapes you know i think there's something about them that's very ornamental and and jewel-like whether it's the fish or the strawberries um i i i love looking at them um, I would uh, slowly um, like to bring us back to the Bay with David Huffman's work, the Bay mm. Area. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so uh, but just to show that the, the proportion of how it was in, in our galleries, how these pieces were in, in our galleries, um, this is on the third floor. It is on the third floor, yeah, on the third floor. And the first piece that I would like to go to is Berkeley. So, so we we had these very charged conversations uh, about these pieces, <laughs> and I don't mind being charged about it because um, those who know me know that I, I'm not. And so we we're just kind of thinking about the juxtaposition of Berkeley with Madagascar, and and really, um, you know, Madagascar. We talk about environmental degradation and the slash and burn. Um, agricultural practices and so you know I think a lot of the docents were just kind of like well well then why is Berkeley so cool and and I'll just lead right into um because I, I do I do have a very um I don't know um and a, a, a not the best personal relationship with the city of Berkeley, you know, in itself as someone who grew up in Oakland, but had family in Berkeley. And I know David grew up in Berkeley also. And, you know, when you say the word Berkeley, the first thing that comes up to your mind is protest and, you know, civil rights fighting. And, you know, I, I have been surprised that 
the university kind of has that or it doesn't anymore now that it's it's becoming less about the local people um but also um but but also berkeley is surprisingly as a city is very conservative and has become more and more conservative so you know i almost kind of feel like i'm on the record and i don't mind it <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but but you know in, in in the in the popular imagination or the, or the stories we think about berkeley as this place that's stuck in the 60s we don't think about the gentrification that mm -hmm. has come um that has completely changed it and i wonder if that's a reason why david has chosen to, to have the strip of red that the blue layers on to create the purple or the pink that we see at the top of, of like yeah maybe that maybe that that fire in our imagination is gone. And then also the watery thing makes me think about, I have some family members who were part of the uh, waterfront gang in Berkeley, which is also one of the most notorious gangs or, or was at least um, within Berkeley. So, so I start to, maybe I'm over processing, overthinking about this, but I also know David had you know, watched his mother and the, especially the women in his family um, fight for civil rights. And so, you know, and protest. And so it, it just makes me think of, of like, what, what was his color choice for this, this very soft indigo blue um, and, and, and with these two pieces and having them side by side. Hmm. Yeah, Kitson says, we've been lulled into thinking that we think about Berkeley. It's no longer what it was once. Oh, wow. Well, we're representing, uh, Dimitri, uh, you're representing um, Berkeley for us. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, question about the, these pieces also. I mean, I definitely, I'm Kathy or Jackie, do you want, do you have any uh, response or um, any anything to add to Dimitri, what Dimitri just said? And I have a, a question. Um, yeah, I can I can say something, um, you know, similar to Alan D'Souza's use of abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, um, David Huffman is, is doing something similar, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not completely abstract, again, similar to Alan's work, in that we see, um, you know, the way that he's created these patterns is through the use of a basketball net, mm -hmm. a basketball hoop net. Um, and so there are um, cultural resonances um, there. The, the, the question of the titles, um, you know, I can't, I can't really speak to, you know, why he titled the blue piece um, Berkeley and the, and the red piece, um, or the orange piece Madagascar Fire. Uh, Jackie, you might be able to jump in, can you? I, you know, we, when he talked about it, he just said, you know, these are Madagascar is not a place he's ever been to, actually, mm -hmm. but it was just an idea of Madagascar. And you know, we said, oh, well, what is it about Madagascar? Is it the, is it the children's film? Is it, <laughs> is it that it's, you know, one of the world's largest islands? Is it because of the environmental practices there? Is its proximity to um, to the African continent? And he said, no, it's just, you know, just, just thinking about it. You know, and I think similarly, you know, we know that he's a Berkeley born artist, you know, um, is that his Berkeley, you know, that sort of cool blue, that smoky Berkeley, that um, watery Berkeley, like in Berkeley Pier, the Berkeley of people moving, coming and going in terms of college, you know, in terms of the university, you know, Berkeley changing, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of gentrification. I mean, he he doesn't talk in terms of when he talked with us in those very concrete terms. You know, this was after, you know, hours of being with him and asking them about these things. And, you know, he wasn't going to give us that nugget. You know, he wasn't, yeah. that wasn't what he was doing it for. Uh, my, my question was going to be, I think, um, I, and I can, it, if it's unanswered, that's okay. I, I, I'd like to sit with it too. But are they supposed to be in communication with each other? These two pieces, are they supposed to uh, um, reference each other in any way? Or are they um, sort of separate and on, on in their own um, standalone pieces? Because to me, as I put them right next to each other, um, a lot of things, it, it brings up a lot of things also is that we're uh, comparing an island to or a country to um, to a city a town so how how are they supposed to communicate or do we and also brings up the idea that 
wherever we are, that is our country, that is our island, that is our um, as part of our identity. And so um, just uh, are they supposed to communicate with each other, uh, these pieces or reference each other? One of the things I find interesting, uh, if you could go to the blue one for a second. Today. Okay. Or, yeah. You <laughs> want it to zoom or? Okay. One of the things that this makes me think of is, you know, I think about uh, Man Ray and what he used to do with his ray of rays. You know, he used to put these various different objects onto a uh, x-ray plate. And then so you would get these really, really weird shapes and forms. I, I know that that's not what he's doing here. I mean, I've seen the, the videos of him actually using the paint on the uh, on the canvas of with, with these, these basketball nets. But it really makes me think about that. You know, mm -hmm. when I see this, you know, I, it's like I'm seeing the ray of rams in blue with, with hints of, 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 of pink in them. You know, it's just, a, I think it's visually just a stunning look. Even, you know, even with the Madagascar one, both of them are just visually really stunning. And I, you know, when do you get this great, you know, connection between art and basketball? It's so great that he's, you know, that he's using a basketball net for his, for his medium. I, I think it's really fascinating work. It is. Um, I would like to, I would like us to um, come back home. Hyper local artist, um, Adia Millet with this one. Yeah. By the way, I think she's joining us today. I don't know if she's actually here, but I am super excited about that. I saw her name and I was just so excited that she she might be here with us. Hi, Adia, if you're here. Hi, Adia, I know I was supposed to remind you, I forgot, I thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, another artist who's very much inspired by um, a literary work, mm -hmm. The Fire Next Time, coming from James Baldwin's 1960s, um, very thin book, but very powerful kind of Jeremiah talking about what it meant for America in the 1960s to confront its present, to think about its past, and certainly with its um, resonance in terms of um, the Bible. It comes from that line about, you know, when God said to Noah, you know, next time it won't be water, it'll be fire, the fire next time. And thinking about, you know, Baldwin pulling that together in the 1960s, you know, when, of course, the country was in this tumult um, mm -hmm. around, you know, not only in terms of racism, discrimination, um, as well as the Vietnam War opposition, um, rights for all kinds of disenfranchised groups, um, American, um, Native American people, indigenous people, Latinos, as well as people of African descent. And I think what, you know, for Adia is she's saying, you know, thinking about this house, you know, which is always the metaphor for the nation, you mm -hmm. know, is it that we want to be in this house? You know, a nation is, is an imagined community as um, the uh, sociologist Benedict Ar um, Anderson talked about it. Nations are arbitrary, you know, they're just people coming together to say, we have this in common and we will create these borders and call ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, France, or we will call ourselves Sierra Leone, or we will call ourselves, you know, um, uh, Burma or, 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 or Myanmar. And, you know, for Adia to choose this metaphor of the house and to wonder about its, its sustainability, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and what it means in terms of communities and identities, I think, in, and to make it strange, as much as any of the artists in the exhibition do, you know, she too wants to make these familiar icons, these familiar images odd unusual, strange. Charlie talked about the, you know, surrealist um, sort of um, uh, maybe thread through um, some of the images, including what we just saw with Huffman. And I think housing and being a house, it really does challenge our vulnerabilities as, as humans. If you've lost a house by fire or if you've lost a house by water or if you've been displaced as people, if you're not in your own house, and all that that brings to the conversation mm. of, you know, where is here in terms of us having a house or feeling homeless and mm. gentrification, especially in San Francisco and London and the housing crisis that we're, you know, from meta to macro.
the detail work, um, the detail and the materials of her work are just so beautiful and kind of, it's very, very neat and, and really nicely done. Um, and in this one, I noticed that it kind of the windows, it, is it steam? Is it, is it fire? Uh, what are they, uh, is it, what's going on? Is it smoke? Um, and I like that, that ambiguity of this house that to me, um, it's under the stars. It's it's a nice night. It's under the stars. I don't see anything burning, um, but I still wonder about the what is in, in these windows, you know. Yeah. And the little piece of metal work that yeah. again almost looks like the Sankofa symbol mm. in the window. Oh yeah, I definitely see that. Kathy or Jackie, can you give us any insight into that that really great little? Moby Dick that's jammed in the in the window. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that detail, but I, I don't. Can you can you enlighten us at all about that? We haven't talked to Adia about it, but I do think that it's her again bringing this literary um, totem, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, juxtaposing the literary allusion not only to the Bible and to Baldwin, but also to this canonical object. You know, something that is the you know the the chaotic chase right chasing after the great whale and it bringing about death you know and i think that's what really hovers over this project as well you know um what is going to survive and what is going to perish from the earth and you know the aspect of it with the birds which are these crows these ominous forces and she at the same time thinks about the birds as something that also relates to our identities as human beings, you know, just other forms of animals that are of the spirit, you know, after which, you know, um, other things have been somehow extracted, that these birds are the energy and the, and the energy of something we have in common, even as human animals with the avian. Um, I think it's also really interesting that we're in October and <laughs> there's these <laughs> there's these very Halloween like birds that definitely conjure, you know, images of like Alfred Hitchcock's um, mm. the birds. But then also the fact that they're all black birds and mm. you know, connecting to to Baldwin and you know, and then my rec realization that a you know, a flock of crows is called a murder and just then, you know the extraordinarily negative connotation of that. Um, and, and almost like she's, she's, she's almost giving the birds a new life and a new meaning. So, so they're not this haunting, um, you know, sign of, of bad things to come, but, but, they're, but the, there's, there's something else, there is a hope behind them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that that same idea even comes with this, the, the burning house, but it's behind the, it's behind the gold. Um, so, so, so there is some there there is something positive um, behind it, even though the house is is engulfed in flames, or mm. or at least smoking, and the roof is flying apart. Um, and then there was also that huge one where it almost is like the mothership beckoning us. <laughs> I don't know if we have it. Yeah, yeah, that one where it's like it's like literally coming apart, and you feel. Like, like there's something, there's this ray of hope, a pyramid or something um, in it. So it's just this interesting, you know, mm. and I want to tell a story <laughs> the entire time to myself. Yeah. Hey. I just, I just yes, yeah, so go ahead, go ahead. Kathy. Yeah, you, can you go back to that, um, to the previous slide? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Adia talked about was and, and um, these birds as the traces of what's what's left behind mm. once the house is burned down. And if we think about, Jackie talked about the house as a metaphor for the nation, but we can also um, talk about the house as a metaphor for our own identities and our own bodies, right? So um, the, the dissolution of our material selves, what, what does it leave behind and, um, Dimitri, you, you're talking about you know, crows as 
as a negative, you know, in, in, in terms of um, their, their negative connotations, but actually corvids are really smart birds that love to play, you know, you can talk to them, they'll talk right back <laughs> to you. So, so this is a very interesting, um, you know, that she uses she's referencing these um these birds that have a bad reputation but that are actually um quite uh um ex exciting and 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 wonderful if if we took the time to um, pay attention to them um, oh i didn't know anything about these birds that's so interesting <laughs> yeah that's awesome and crows remember crows remember mm. uh, they remember faces they remember moments they're they're very smart they also like to play, they play. And, you know, um, our, our last piece, and if I may keep you for a couple more minutes, because I have, again, I have so many questions. Um, and um, our last artist that we're going to talk about is um, Olalekan Jefus. And the first, um, the first, this is what it looked like in the galleries. This is um, sort of to see the, the proportion. This is what they looked like. And we'll show these pieces individually. This is the first piece. Um, I really love, I really love this work. I, today I was thinking about um, the way that he he incorporates a number of architectural traditions um, from the use of geometry in Islamic art and architecture to mm -hmm. the rose windows of um, Gothic um, Gothic churches and also the stilt houses um, and it, you know in a way I was thinking a lot about you know the the aesthetic and the form but I I today was realizing that these are also, um, they provide solutions, right? Uh, to, for example, the, the geometric um, lattice work uh, that you see in windows in um, the Middle East and, uh, and Egypt um, and, and India as well. Um, that, that allows for cool air to come in uh, to a space um, while keeping the bright sunlight out. So it's a shade that keeps a, keeps the cool space in. Um, and then these silt, these houses um, on stilts, right, will protect you from rising waters or mm -hmm. protect a structure from rising waters. Um, and, you know, the Gothic architecture as well has, um, you know, was a, an incredible um, innovation, uh, which enabled builders to, to build high and and wide without the use of large pillars so um, churches became more light filled so in a lot of ways you know the diverse definitely there's a cultural diversity that's referenced here but also you know there is um this question of you know how how do people manage their spaces in terms of um the environments that, mm. that they're in and um to create um you know safe a safe uh and comfortable space Wow. Yeah. And why a, um, a temporal relic? I'm curious about that. Yeah, because they're they're fantasy pieces. They're mm -hmm. um, what did they used to call them in um, in England? Follies, almost. You know, they're not to be actually lived in. These are very tiny, little um, mixed media works. And so um, it, not only in terms of their scale, but also in terms of their design, there's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not following one architectural tradition um, mm -hmm. in a certain time. It's actually out of time. It's beyond time. It's atemporal. It's not literal to a time or a space. Um, and this idea you know, of them being relics, you know, that is to say something that is, um, um, you know, a relic can be um, both something from the past that is revered, you know, and relics can be actually even remains of people, human reliquaries, right? So what is architecture, but something of, that is a remain of human intervention, not only in terms of the built environment, but of 
making space, reorganizing space. So architecture is not just the form of, you know, the building, the skyscraper, it's the, the roadway, you know, because you can even imagine the pathways around these buildings, you know, you can imagine the um, ways in which people came in and out of them. So it's, it's thinking about, you know, again, something that's imaginary, but at the same time seems to reference human activity and human creativity. I also love the fact that, um, especially not so much with the one on stilts, but with the other two, the really odd footprint that these make. You know, they're, they're not meant to be in a grid. They, they're, they're, it's, it's almost as though they're taking up orphan spaces in a block somewhere. It, it, and of course, the, the combination of the different architectural styles. I mean, to me, if you look at, uh, if we could go back to that yellow one for just a second, um, you know, uh, you, you've got this thing that almost looks like it, it'd be Venetian with that little bit hanging out over the side, you know, and then you've got this, you know, the, these other parts which look, God, I mean, it's such a wonderful mixture and sort of playfulness of all these different architectural styles. Yeah, it's almost like, um, well, you know, in, in, in crowded urban spaces, um, you know, you have the space that you have, right? So you, you work with what you have. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, you get get in where you fit in kind of thing is <laughs> what I think about when I see these. Um, and I, I, you know, I really think about, though he uses the term atemporal, they really remind me of um, the medieval uh, period somehow, you know, from, from the traditions that he evokes. Um, yeah, I'm, so, I'm so, so happy to return to these, uh, all of these artworks. I, I think for I think for me, as you're saying medieval, and maybe because we recently had orange skies in in the Bay Area, and uh, for for me, I went back to Blade Runner and thinking about you know the the arch well I you know so 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 moving up and and how you know what is the future of architecture um, yeah. you know because he's he's playing on so many different traditions that are of the past. That have never existed together. So is this is this future architecture? Is this, you know, what happens when when we've taken up all of the earth? And you know, we were even having discussions about the stilt houses. Like as our sea levels rise, are we all going to have to start living in stilt houses mm -hmm. and and travel by boat? Um, so you know, it just gives you a lot of things to think about. It's very appropriate to the downtown area where Moab yeah. is, you know, the history of alleyways that disappeared mm -hmm. um, because of urban renewal and the building up of South of Market. And, you know, people said, you know, these, 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 these walkways are going to disappear um, at the time of, um, you know, when it was being um, developed. And, uh, you know, they, it's come to pass. And now we have these strange little spaces just around where you all are, um, where the buildings are around the corners. It's, it's very apropos. All right, well, thank you so much. And I would like to um, end by saying thank you. And I would like us to go back to um, I'm going to stop sharing and let's see each other and um, have if, if anyone has questions, are there any questions that uh, that folks have uh, for definitely for Kathy and, and Jackie for for, from, uh, for all of us? What, what the, I, I, um, I've been wondering one question that I have is um, the, the fish, the, the fish, how, how is that related to where is here and how did that fit into the whole idea of, um, yeah, Terry Fontaine's work fitting into and the other ones, it was easy for me to access where is here in terms of space. That one was a bit challenging for me. So I would love to hear from um, Kathy and Jackie about that. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think um, yeah, I'm going to bring up the term abstraction again. Um, I think that, you know, we, we, we tried to identify artworks that, that referenced place in ways, but without being very specific. And so um, in, 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 in the case of Thierry Fontaine's work, we were thinking about the, the place in terms of uh, the environment. We we're thinking about um, the earth as um, our the source of our sustenance, the place where we 
the place where we live, um, it, you know, how, how safe it is and how, how well we take care of it. Jackie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, oftentimes we talk, we, at the beginning, we talked about landscape, but it's not just landscape, right? The earth is more than two thirds water. It's mm -hmm. water and seascape. And of course, just as Dimitri was saying about rising seas, you know, there's something about the fish and fishing industry that is also a place making thing, even mm -hmm. as the ocean is this, or oceans are these vast seas, but they are also territory that nations, you know, really go to war over. I was just listening to something about um, the, the North Sea in terms of Ireland and how with Brexit, this has created a so much trouble, um, especially for those industries in Ireland um, and Scotland, fisheries and oil, et cetera. So the where is here is always mm -hmm. about something that anchors us to the place, which is why the title is not just question, it's also declaration. You know, it's a brilliant idea that Kathy one day said, you know, let's, what about that, that, that the where is a noun as opposed to mm. an interrogator. So the fish kind of place the, the subject somewhere, somewhere where there's a fishing sort of industry or fishing culture, and that could be anywhere. Mm. Also, uh, for me, just kind of, as you said, that just made, made me feel of like how we got here is across the oceans and, and across the seas and this, that whole idea of a fish out of water, mm -hmm. you know, that saying is a fish out of water, which I definitely relate to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a follow-up question for the two of you, because I think, you know, and now that we are right at the four-year, um, Inaugur or I guess our anniversary of this exhibition opening, um, right? Isn't that wild? Um, <laughs> uh, one day off. I think we opened on October 16. 20 oh, 16. is okay. that true? Oh, that's what it said on the Is thing. it 26? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. I mean, look, okay. I have all these screens up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, it's 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 really interesting with a project like this, and how looking back at it four years later, how relevant it is, and and how you know almost um, forward thinking, you know, those issues definitely existed. But as you said, we're we're definitely in this very strange time right now, where um, you know, who knows what our future is <laughs> at at this point, as we're all is you know, I'm. I'm brought to the fact that we're in an election right now, I guess as we were back then, mm -hmm. um, but oh, you know, wow. more, ac more active in it. And so, you know, this, this question, you may not have an answer to it, but what's next for the two of you? What's your next curatorial project? Because <laughs> I just, you know, again, going back to this, it, it was brilliant at the time, but the, the resonance now is, is so, it's just so much more. And so, you know, what are you two gonna bring for us next? <laughs> All right, well, we need to have a brainstorming session. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had a couple ideas. It's just actually doing them. You know, Kathy has curated um, fantastic shows um, since uh, Where Is Here. We've worked together on other shows uh, as well. Um, we have an idea. We probably shouldn't say it out loud. Um, <laughs> you heard it here. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just got to make time and decide, you know, how to do it. You know, how to how to make the space. And does this and and does a project like this intersect, you know, with the scholarly work that both of you are doing, and in what ways, and and what do you have coming up? And I'm now turning it into like a focus on you, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll say for myself, um, without realizing it, place you know, sort of uh, emerged as the central um, issue that I that I deal with in all of my exhibitions. Uh, so, and you know, maybe that has to do with my experience as a diaspora kid, um, my experience as a Palestinian, my experience as a, uh, a San Franciscan, you know, who can't afford, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm very, I'm hyper aware of, um, of, of place and, and landscape and um, these are important issues to me. Um, and I think they, they, it's becoming more and more obvious uh, the, I think when when this show first opened, 
some I had a feeling like um, audiences had a hard time um, with the sort of general nature of um, the the project, um, which you know about place. But today, you know, the fact that we're you know having to quarantine and isolate, and we can't go to our places, you know, mm -hmm. and our place has become a lot smaller, right? Or so we're we're it, it, it's we've become hyper. Um, um, attuned and uh, to this, to our place um, in the world. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done on this. Jackie, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I I think thinking about projects like I'm working on a project with Adia. She's um, opening a solo show in Hong Kong next month um, that I'm curating. Um, but there's also things that don't seem directly connected. Here's my cat. Um, <laughs> directly connected <laughs> to, um, to uh, the exhibition projects. But you know, there is one that, you know, Kath and I keep thinking about and it's, and it's, it's very located in San Francisco and about, about the experience of negotiating this city and negotiating mm. this region um, at this time in history. Definitely looking forward to all of it, all of it. And so, yeah, I want to say thank you so much. And Charlene, Remy, and Naswan, do you have any anything to add in Naomi? Yes, don't see, forget but, yeah. vote. Everyone don't has to vote. I've already voted. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Him too. <laughs> <laughs> vote early, vote often. I know. <laughs> Chicago, go Chicago. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Thank you all so, so much. And I would like to thank our sponsors as well, AAA. I, um, I would like to thank, and also all everyone that is supporting MOAD right now so we can continue having amazing artists and curators and artwork in the virtual space. And please check out your, our calendar. Uh, it's full of programs it's amazing programs I sometimes um, don't know when I can work because they're just so amazing um, so join us um, join us on those programs thank you so much and um, it is going to end abruptly and so this is my goodbye I want to keep you forever but can we, we gotta go <laughs> thank can you we take a screenshot sure a yeah screenshot. yeah all right get ready <laughs> Can I? I don't know if I can. Hold on one sec. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.